And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. I'm on the lands of the Turbul and the Yagara people in Brisbane. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and any First Nations people joining us today. I'd also like to welcome our speakers, John O'Malley and Bear Kavanagh who are here with us now. Our CEO, Amy McQueen will be joining us at 11.30 as she's finishing up another appointment. My name is Gayatri and I'm the principal advisor for research here at QCOS and I work primarily on living affordability and gender research. So with today's webinar, I'll start by presenting the findings from the Living Affordability Report 2021 before handing it over to John, Dare and Amy. Uh, before we start, just a few housekeeping instructions. This event is being run in the Zoom webinar mode. You will be able to ask questions via the Q&A function. You will also have the ability to comment and upvote each other's questions to maximize interactivity. And we will be moderating this. Uh, this session is being recorded and we will make it available for viewing later via the QCOS website. So let's dive right in. Um, the Living Affordability Report is an annual report that QCOS produces. Through this, we monitor the cost of living pressures for economically vulnerable households in Queensland. For the 2021 report, the interviews and surveys that we conducted with the community service sector have been part of the evidence base that, have, that has informed our advocacy work. Amy will be touching upon our advocacy work in her presentation later. In the past, um, QCOS Living Affordability Research has supported our advocacy campaigns like the No Interest Loan Scheme, the call to increase job seeker payment above the poverty line, and support for abolishing robo-debt. Um, so to monitor living affordability for vulnerable households in Queensland, we use a range of methods. We do quantitative modeling of household budgets from publicly available data. We also use interviews and surveys to understand the impacts of inadequate income support for communities and the services that support them. In this presentation, I will first walk through the results from the household budget models. So each year we select households and create budget profiles for each household from separate national and state data sources. We model the households using a framework called the budget standards approach. These standards define a basic standard of living that goes just beyond subsistence level and provides for essential expenses for households such as health, use of facilities, services, internet access, connecting with people, and maybe an occasional holiday. This standard also allows for modest levels of expenditure on items that contribute to social inclusion and well being, such as recreation, entertainment, and social outings. In all, we budget 26 essential items, and the broad categories are listed on the screen, which are rent, transport, electricity, water, and household expenditure items. Since all the items that we budget for are essential to a basic standard of living, the households that are not able to meet the standard of living over prolonged periods of time face the risk of entrenched disadvantage and poverty. Uh, for anyone interested in the detailed assumptions of the modeling, these are available in the Living Affordability Report, which is on the QCOS website, and we'll share with you after the presentation as well. So once we build these budget standards using uh, contemporary prices, we get income data, mainly from Service Australia calculators and national minimum wage rate data to build the household budgets. So the households we considered this year are, for, for building the budgets are single unemployed adult, dependent on the job seeker payment, a single parent working casually with two dependents, depending on the parenting set payment, single, a two parent family with two dependents, depending on the minimum wage rate, a single student working part time with no dependents, depending on the youth allowance, senior couple with age pension, um, single unemployed older woman not yet eligible for age pension who was on the job seeker and a non-resident family who's unable to access government and social supports. So we included two additional households this year, the unemployed older woman and the non-resident family 
because these were two cohorts that emerged from our research as being significantly impacted by COVID-19 in terms of economic vulnerability since 2020. So this slide really shows out what a built out budget looks like for each of these households. I won't go through each line item, but these are available in the report for in greater detail. As you will see, uh, though the standards include more than a subsistence level of expenditure for each household, putting them above the poverty line, the provisions really are modest and rent is the largest expenditure item for each household. And the total expenditure is in green at the bottom. So once these budgets are built out, we look at whether income support payments are sufficient to meet these basic standards of living. In March 2020, the Australian government introduced an economic stimulus package in response to COVID-19 that included temporary payment supplements to recipients of income support payments. And this included a job seeker payment, the parenting payment single and parenting payment and the youth allowance. These supplements were gradually phased out through the year, through 2021, with the final level of supplement of dollars 150 a fortnight permanently stopped as of 31 March 2021. From the 1st of April 2021, the Australian government introduced a permanent increase to the base rate, which was dollars 50 a fortnight or dollars 3.47 per day. So taking all these changes into consideration, we were able to model two income scenarios for each household. The first one with the $150 payment and the second one with the permanent $50 payment. So what you see in the graph is the weekly budget and surplus deficit for each of our model households. The light orange is the surplus and deficit with the $150 income supplement and the darker orange color is without the income supplement. So right away, we can see that the households that got the income supplements, which is the uh, job seeker, parenting payment, and the youth allowance do better when they receive the in income supplement. The single unemployed household, which is the first set of graphs and the fourth set of graphs that you see, um, they are able to just break even with the supplement. Um, the single parent household does not break even, but are able to do slightly better. Um, here, just to add a, a note about the gendered nature of economic vulnerability, what our data shows is the changing demographic of job seeker recipients over the last two decades. And it shows that an increasing share of older women are now on the job seeker payment. More recent data has shown that an increasing number of older women in Australia are at risk of homelessness because of a range of systemic factors leading to women's economic disadvantage. This includes gender pay gap, a uh, higher likelihood of being in casual employment, lower superannuation balances and low asset ownership. And this was really evident during COVID-19 where another piece of our research showed that women's employment was disproportionately impacted. Women were much more likely to absorb the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, either by reducing their work hours, stepping outside the workforce entirely or working in an industry put by enormous pressure by the crisis. Our modeling also shows that if we use the same assumptions as a single parent household, single parent migrant families that get no income support end up with the worst weekly deficit amongst our households. Um, and here again, financial vulnerability of single parent households is also a highly gendered issue because nearly 80% of single parent households is headed by a mother. Um, with a working family, where one adult earns minimum wages and the other works casually, uh, this family is unable to meet our, our living standard, even though wages are the main source of income, putting them into the working poor category. Um, I'm, I'm, this, I'm not showing this in the graph here, but we used RTA regional rental data and extrapolated all these findings to regional Australia. And we see similar patterns for uh, our household, our model households across the state. So um, that was the first part of our research, which was updating the household, the hypothetical household models with 2021 data. So further to this, we also wanted to ground truth these findings. So what does this really look like? What do the impacts look like in Queensland communities? 
So we designed the Living Affordability Survey and did interviews with frontline staff, including financial counselors, mills workers, emergency relief workers in Queensland to understand what these impacts were. We received nearly 100 survey responses and followed them up with in-depth interviews with community sector staff. So when respondents were asked what the most significant impacts of inadequate incomes was in their communities, 85% reported the inability to cope with unplanned expenses, 78% said it was the inability to pay regular bills, and 70% reported the inability to afford essentials like food, clothing, housing, medicines, and transport. So this is in line with the findings from our budget models that these households are not able to meet basic living expenses and definitely don't have anything left to save or have any room for unplanned expenses. Moreover, nearly 70% of our respondents said that mental health and anxiety caused by financial hardship was of significant concern to their clients. Other issues included high indebtedness caused by buy now pay later schemes. So we had some themes that come up again and again when we spoke to uh, community sector staff. The first among them being housing stress being the biggest issue for households that are dependent on income support. And this can be seen in our models as well because rent is more than 30% of weekly household expenditure for most of our model households, which is the definition for house housing stress. We heard this across Queensland, not just with our living affordability work, but with all our town hall and member engagements across the state. Secondly, we heard that this hardship is not just a one-off occurrence. People depending on income support payments are having to constantly make choices between paying rent and other essentials like food. This can have significant impacts on mental health and people's ability to participate in social and economic life. We also heard that unplanned expenses can cause huge setbacks and in indebtedness. Like one respondent told us, yeah, life happens and it happens all the time. We also heard about the accumulation of fines and penalties, including SPUR for low income households of being, being of a significant concern. Respondents told us medication that was not covered under the pharmaceutical benefits scheme was unaffordable for people in low incomes. And this included appropriate care for mental health issues, physiotherapy sessions and other specialist treatments. Energy costs were highlighted as being of a big issue, especially in the summer months. Um, we also asked respondents what the main causes of financial hardship were. Uh, quite unsurprisingly, 88% of majority of them identified low income as the primary cause for financial hardship. This was followed by unemployment or underemployment and then followed by low financial literacy. So related to this finding that structural and policy settings drive a lot of the entrance hardship we see, a number of respondents to our survey and interviews reflected on the pervasive commentary and language that stigmatized people accessing income support payments. We also heard about the benefits of what the increased income support payments in the form of COVID-19 supplements brought. We heard that households were able to meet basic needs, that they didn't have to depend on emergency relief to meet their basic requirements. Respondents told us income supports improved mental health and people actually used the supplement money to pay off outstanding bills and debts. So, um, I want to wrap up the data part of my presentation by showing you the results of another piece of research we did on emerging issues in the sector. Um, and I bring this up because this data verifies a number of things that we found in our living affordability research. And this comes from the Australian Community Sector Survey. This is an annual survey run by the University of New South Wales. Uh, this year, over 700 staff from community services organizations in Queensland responded to this survey, and I'm presenting two graphs from this, this research. The first graph on the left looks at main issues faced by people and communities, and this looks a lot like what we saw in our living affordability research. So housing is the biggest issue, followed by cost of living pressures and then lack of access to mental health supports. For the graph on the right, we see that the majority of respondents reported that there were significant increases in the number of clients that community service organizations were not able to support, increased levels of demand, increased levels of poverty and disadvantage in their communities. 
From the same survey, we also found that 62% of the respondents said that they felt emotionally drained from their work. Uh, to wrap up, um, here are some of the key uh, areas that we touched on, our recommendations in the report. The first one is to ensure that a basic standard of living can be met by all Queensland households by raising the rate of income support payments. Second, improve, to improve energy affordability and reduce energy vulnerability for low-income households. Third, protect households experiencing vulnerability from high cost and risky sources, including payday loans, consumer leases, and buy now pay later schemes. Four, protect individuals experiencing vulnerability from accumulated fines and penalties that are unduly onerous and contribute to deepening financial hardship. And lastly, ensure policies and programs address gender equality and promote equal opportunities for all. So I, I will stop there. Um, I think we might have a few minutes for, for questions before we move on to there. Right. It, um, we might not have any any questions. We we have some time to answer questions towards the end as well. Um, so moving on to there, I'd just like to make a quick introduction to there and warmly welcome her as our next speaker. Uh, there joined Good Shepherd as the regional manager for the Nils Community Network, New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia, and the ACT in early 2021. Uh, originally from Canada, Dare migrated to Australia via Sweden and the UK. Throughout her career, Dare has worked in a wide variety of human service sectors, including education, health, housing, placemaking, gender equity, and sustainability. With a master's in primary health care, fo focused on the social de determinants of health, and a graduate diploma in dialogue, deliberation, and public participation, Dare champions a client-centered, strengths-based approach to service development and delivery, and values diverse input into decision making. And Dare lives in Sydney with her teenage sons Archie, Leo, and Kingston, her dog. Welcome, Dare. Thank you very much, Gayatri, and thanks for your um, fantastic presentation. I'm uh, excited to be uh, joining you all here from um, Gadigal country um, of the in the beautiful Aora Nation. I also pay my respects to the um, elders past and present here, but also of the uh, Six Nations of the Iroquois people where I grew up uh, on the uh, shining lakes of Lake Ontario, in those beautiful waters and lands. It's land that was never ceded. And um, I uh, acknowledge the traditional owners where everybody is, where we have uh, quite a geographic spread here today. And um, it's exciting to be um, talking to you all. Although I think the, the topic that we're, we're faced with today is really not, um, not a really happy one. Uh, I'm not surprised, Gayatri, at Good Shepherd, we experienced the same thing when you said that people used the uh, additional COVID payments to help um, pay off debts. It was um, fabulous to see um, the number of people who uh, had previously been taking advantage of no interest loans um, to help with some of that bill shock or with the, um, the unexpected um, uh, expenses, um, pay those off very happily when they actually had enough money in their pocket. And I think to me, that comes down to a bit of um, where are we all at? And what are the key issues that are facing us? Um, and it's what is uh, in our control to work with, with our clients and what's in uh, our work bigger in terms of advocacy. And those are the kinds of themes I wanted to um, talk about today and bring us really back to, to basics in some respect with what's our role. I was also really um, impacted by the, the statement in the research from um, community workers when many of them said that they were emotionally drained. And um, 
I think we're hearing a lot about um, the nurses, we're hearing a lot about care workers, and I think as community workers, community development workers, we're not as much in the limelight, we're a bit more in the, uh, a bit backstage in a lot of respects, and I think that acknowledging the impact that this last couple of years, particularly in Queensland, in these last few months um, has had on, um, on our, our workforce and our colleagues. So if you go to the next slide for me, please, Maria. Um, it was really thinking about what's our, our uh, approach here? What is the, the basic cornerstones to our approach in terms of community development? And these are at the heart of Good Shepherd and at the heart of the practice, I'm sure, for most of us here. Empowerment, human rights, uh, self-determination, collective action, and really thinking about that in a social justice context. So if we're thinking about those principles in response to what we've just heard that our communities are facing, what's the action that we can all bring as community workers? And what's the action that Good Shepherd is leading? If you wanna to go to the next slide for me, I think if we look at that again, absolutely basic community development 101, we're, we're, we're looking across the spectrum from the individual person, their family and household, the community that surrounds them and the bigger society. And I think all of us know where, where we may have in our practice, a real sense of a, a niche about um, which um, uh, of those aspects appear, is the one that really speaks to us. Um, and where we want to put our energy at a given time. It's working across that whole um, paradigm that really where we can make an impact. Now, I've just gotten an, um, uh, uh, an announcement on my phone that it's uh, going on to low battery. So if I fall out, I'll join you from my, my laptop. But um, if we move on to the next slide, that'll help me move a bit more quickly so I don't drop out in the middle. In Good Shepherd, we look at um, uh, uh, actions such as the provision of no interest loans um, and um, financial inclusion work as a very client-centered individual. And with that, moving with the safety and resilience into looking at a household. And where is that, that um, where does that work happen? We also have actions and activities that focus on um, building the capacity in the sector. Uh, my colleague Karen in, in Queensland with you has been working tirelessly for um, well over a decade in building sector capacity to enable a whole community approach. And then of course Good Shepherd is also looking at advocacy and research. Um, and I have a, a few um, uh, points I would like to make on that as well. If you want to go to the next slide for me, Maria, that would be great. Um, the um, the um, financial inclusion and resilience is the part of Good Shepherd that um, I'm working in. And really, it's, it's also looking at that spectrum, as I pointed out in the previous um, diagram. It's uh, through our, uh, our programs, we span quite a range of different approaches that uh, we can almost use some of the same words for all of them, but certainly the community network providing no interest loans gives a breadth across the state that really can respond, it doesn't respond to every single issue that was raised, but when we see that people saying inadequate income to be able to meet unexpected expenses, that's uh, central to what the no interest loan was set up for. And many community organizations sort of took that idea and ran with it across um, the whole length and breadth of Queensland. And then in thinking more about that, um, and how we could uh, deepen the work that we were using, establishing the two good money stores, one in the north and one in the south, that can be centers of excellence and really focus on um, how can we go deeper and learn more just about the financial part, whereas the Nils Community Network sees that financial resilience as part of the, the whole range of services that can be provided 
today, for example, by our friends at St. Vincent de Paul that provide a range of services, meals being one portion of it. In the Good Money Store, they're focusing on the loan and providing that um, financial support, financial conversation around that. Um, people may be aware that Good Shepherd is also delivering um, the Financial Independence Hub and um, Financial uh, Family and Domestic Violence No Interest Loans centrally. And those are add-on services that um, organizations and community workers that are focused on supporting people who have experienced family and domestic violence, they can access these without having to themselves be a fully fledged NILS provider. These are uh, additional services that provide that. We also, in terms of our work to um, help give some backbone to the financial inclusion, have um, major partnerships, three of which are really central to the work we do in Queensland. Our partnership with, with DSS, through the uh, our work with them, we're able to put more than a million dollars, almost a million, almost $1.3 million into um, Queensland community workers um, uh, sector to be able to provide for some of the no interest loans. Our partnership with NAB takes that pressure away from anyone who is doing no interest loans um, from having to look for capital. People who've been in the sector for a long time, the time spent looking for capital to be able to um, uh, provide more loans to help cover those unexpected expenses. Um, that was a, a major part that's now we've been able to, through our partnership, um, resolve that. And in Queensland, more than anywhere else in the country, um, we see low income households taking advantage of the partnership that we have with the good guys to be able to get um, lower cost items delivered for free um, and have the old items removed and the difference that that makes in people's lives. And when we think about that, it really rings through with me one of the stories from Queensland of a woman getting um, a brand new fridge and for the first time having something brand new that she chose herself, that she was paying for, that wasn't a rental, that she didn't have to go second best or second hand. And um, the prize that she had and being able to do that and pay that off and where that in itself helps to um, combat some of the uh, mental health impacts of um, struggling day to day on a low income. And then, of course, I want to uh, introduce just briefly here that over the coming months, people will hear more about the financial resilience pilot program that the Queensland government has asked Good Shepherd to work together with our friends at uh, Neighborhood Centers Queensland to be able to deliver. And so with this really it's, um, I have at the top building on our history and creating for the future. You know, um, Good Shepherd has been for many decades operating uh, different kinds of programs in Queensland and had a, a lot of services based there and continuing to do that as we go into the future. And one of the, the key aspects I think that has kept the work um, for more than 400 years really going and really driving is that focus, what is the next need? What, what more can we be doing? Uh, we no longer need to have residential um, facilities for people with a disability or for um, uh, people with some needs that the Good Shepherd um, sisters had been doing in years gone by. Now it's how do we support people with what's the emerging need? And there's nothing more um, timely right now than looking at financial inclusion and resilience. Um, if you want to go to our um, next um, slide for me, Maria, I wanted to just for a second, um, also stop to look at what is our, um, our focus on the bigger picture. So as well as doing the direct service delivery, supporting the sector and making a difference in that way. I think when we look at the advocacy and research ring in the diagram I showed um, at, the, um, uh, at the start, it's, it's there's so and so much we can do with working client by client or community by community, but if we're not also engaged um, as QCOS is 
and uh, many other advocacy groups in trying to help change the whole paradigm. Um, we can create, we um, can, can work to be resolving issues and to be making a difference in the lives of people. But if we can um, join with uh, other advocacy groups and be sharing our voice to make a difference in, um, in, the, in the bigger picture, I think that is also something that is really um, uh, in, uh, incumbent on us if we see things that need to be changed to speak up. And in terms of our budget submission from Good Shepherd for the, for the federal budget this year, it's very similar to the kinds of things that, um, that we're hearing from other advocacy groups. And I know Amy will be talking a bit more about um, the QCOS one um, a bit later. Delivering on quality job support that's tailored for women, really understanding the gendered impact of what's happened in the last couple of years. In particular, one of the um, important um, con con contributors to women's financial well-being has been micro businesses, supporting women to be able to set up, set their own um, agenda and make their own money in that way, promoting um, funding. Um, uh, promoting and funding the economic safety measures in the national plan to end violence against women and children. Absolutely central that we can combat um, this scourge that has a huge financial impact and keeps women and children in poverty. Um, supporting the safe use of buy now, pay later, uh, combating the um, uh, unregulated and underregulated sectors in the finance industry that keep people and into cycles of poverty that's unacceptable and using commonwealth rent assistance to build women's housing security if we put that much money into rent assistance how can we help women particularly older women at risk of falling into homelessness to be able to um, take steps to secure long-term housing outcomes and i think so for me, thinking about what are we doing with the individual and communities? What are we doing in, uh, and here's an example, shaping things for the future. But I think if we go to the next slide, one of the things I also really wanted to say is what are we doing to support ourselves in, um, as we work in this important work making a difference? And one of my favorite quotes is that, uh, again, a very good community development um, quote, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. And I think all of us are there every day in our work, planting those seeds and making the difference and making sure that that's fruitful, making sure that and to be fruitful, we have to be well and we need to be looking after ourselves, ensuring that you take the time to appreciate the successes that you've had to look after yourself and make sure that we don't have a whole sector of burnout. All of the indicators are pointing to huge burnout across the whole care sector. And I encourage everyone to take the time to make sure that they are well. And I think things like this where we can stay together and really um, take collective action, find that strength in one another so we know that we're working together and then take that action together. What are the things that we can impact? What do we need to raise our voice for? And I think that if we really go back to the basics with our practice, understand the opportunities that we have to make a difference, that will help pave the way for greater long-term success. And that's the, the path that we're taking at Good Shepherd and the um, uh, actions that we are working on in Queensland. And I hope to uh, meet more of you uh, in person and virtually over time and be able to talk more about what we're doing. Uh, and that was all that I had to, to share with us today. I'm happy to take questions or to uh, hand back over to you, Gayatri. You're still on mute, Gayatri. And if I lose my video, I'm still listening in. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dea, for, for a wonderful presentation. It was really nice to hear about everything that 
Good Shepherd's doing both at the community level and at a systemic and advocacy level. And I can see how there are synergies in what we are saying and the collective action that you call for. And it's, it's uh, uh, we were just discussing this morning that we understand that this is, this the work is really hard, but then we, uh, the collective action, I think is what will get us through, um, yeah. through getting this done. Um, do we have any questions for or comments for for there? Okay. Um, in that case, uh, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, uh, John O'Malley. Um, so John, uh, many of you may, you may know John, he's been involved in the financial community for a number of years, way back from 1995, where he spent uh, 14 years with Center Care with Kenya Forbes, predominantly as a regional manager for the Orana region and coordinator for financial counseling and money management programs. Uh, John then decided to relocate to Cairns and implement similar positive change when he joined the Indigenous Consumer Assistance Network, ICANN, in September 2009, and this is where he resides today. Uh, John has for a number of years facilitated the development, management, evaluation and maintenance of comprehensive financial well-being programs. He co-developed and chaired the Far North Queensland Consumer Task Force Group, was a previous president of the Financial Counselors Association of Queensland, co-developed the Yarn and Money program and successfully wavered over $110 million of debt for vulnerable clients. John's current community representative roles include the ASIC Advisory Panel, uh, the Queensland Competitive, Competitive Authority, CBA Community Council, and he's also representative for the Westpac One Rule Consumers Council. Welcome, John. Thanks, Kaitri. It's, it's a fairly big intro, isn't it? <laughs> um, I, I'd like to um, uh, pay respects and acknowledge the the traditional owners that I reside on, the, the Yirrkanji people, which is part of the Yadinji clan in Cairns. Um, I also, in, in starting this, if we can go straight into the slide, because I think, you know, um, we're a little bit behind, but I wanted to just get straight into the, the meat of the pie, because this is such a concerning. And if we looked at just with your report, you know, the financial affordability report, but, you know, in other um, states as well with the delivery of their report, it's, it's, a, it's a constant throughout Australia. Um, and I think what we base ourselves or an understanding of where poverty is in Australia is, and I, and I looked at, you know, the household budget and the basic standard approach to that. But if you looked at, you know, the definition of, of what poverty is. Um, and, I, and I took this from the St. Vincent de Paul because they sort of broke it up to the national research as well. And basically in Australia, the poverty line is $150, $157 per week per single out, um, adult, which you sort of identified in your previous information there, Gayatri. And the poverty line is measured as a 50%, if it's coming back and forth the presentation. I'll just wait for me. Yeah, we're just putting your presentation up. I'm just going to share my screen and. But basically, while whilst that presentation is coming up, I mean, in, in, in Gayatri's presentation as well, it gives you a, a really clear picture of how um, how difficult it is for someone to to keep above that poverty line in Australia. And if anything happens um, on an economic front, so to speak, um, and we're seeing that now and people might think, oh, it's the cost of living. Well, it's, in fact, it's actually the movement or the shift in property prices that is playing a real impact on homelessness at the moment um, across Australia. And we can see that in Queensland. On average, it's about 12 to 13 percent. But in these, at the moment, we're peaking at 18 percent, a homelessness rate in, in Queensland. Um, and when the GFC came about uh, in 2008 or 2007, 2008, uh, it saw the same peak. It peaked at about 17 percent. I think that um, 
you will see a constant in this peak of homelessness. And that is a reflection of where we sit in regards to poverty as well. So when, so you can get a clear indication of, I'm sort of setting the scene as to what we do as community workers, but what the government needs to do to respond. Um, and I think the most important thing, and Dare sort of touched on, I saw one of the things, but we, we grapple with mainstream social um, responses and viewpoints. And I think this is something that government also struggles with. They can probably see that there's an issue here, but it also comes down to the vote. And unfortunately, mainstream society have different views to, to what our views are um, to people that are vulnerable, um, and which is quite unfortunate. Um, and I'm not saying that all people feel that, you know, people should you know, go get a job or, you know, that it's their, it's self-responsibility in regards to their own situation. Um, but there, there is, there is a mainstream view, which does impact on this as well, particularly from a government response. Um, and so if you looked at the pillars that lead to poverty, obviously, as I mentioned, you know, the global domestic pressures, economic pressures, whether it be that be the cost of living, um, you know, we've had a couple of examples such as GFC and, and COVID of recent that actually push domestic, it shifts, um, you know, money into different areas and pushes up prices, um, creates unemployment, and obviously the domino effect happens. Another key thing is housing. And we're seeing that in Queensland at the moment. We, were under, we have an undersupply of housing and a high demand for it. Um, and, that, and therefore, and that's the cost and the shift. So when property prices go up, you know, landlords are looking for increased rent, people on the poverty or, you know, on the poverty line or in a, or in a vulnerable or financial vulnerable um, situation can't afford to meet those increased costs. Um, and therefore, obviously, the homeless rate um, rises. And again, too, and we've touched on this both Gayatri and Dare about the importance of our wealth, welfare system and meeting these increased costs. And unfortunately, I don't have the statistics there, but it hasn't changed for quite some time, a very minimal um, compared to what the costs have over, over that period of time. And I think we don't need to push to go back to the supplements under COVID because I, I know that the government will eventually go broke. But I do think the government needs to look at increasing, and you can see through the, the um, diagrams that Gayatri provided us beforehand, that even you know, sixty to hundred dollars a fortnight extra would make a massive difference. I think the government needs to show some um, a, a proactive approach to okay, we have a pool of money, but this is so important where we need to sort of maybe cut the fat in other areas of, of the budget. Um, and I think that goes along with changing you know society's opinion of how important um, it is to reduce poverty in Australia because the impacts of poverty also impacts all of us um, in the long run. So I, I just wanted to share that with you first before I go into the financial counselling and capability space in Queensland. So if we go to the next slide, Maria. Um, so what does it look like in, in Queensland at the moment? We get a good read of what's happening in this space because we have a membership, we're an association and we have a membership um, for people who just, if we can just go back. Yep, thanks. For people who um, provide financial counselling and financial capability work. Now, if you want a capability is really, there's so many names under capability and who, who fall under it. Um, I, I believe NILS workers, I believe um, whether it be re resilience workers, budget coordinators, budget navigators, you name it, there's a whole suite of people that have a title that come under this space. At the moment, our membership is has reduced and that's because COVID money has been retracted to put more financial councils on the ground. Um, where at the moment we have 103 practicing financial councils in Queensland. Uh, 
40% of that is part-time. So if you have a look at all the information that Gayatri and Dare have provided in regards to, you know, what Good Shepherd is doing, but, you know, particularly Q costs in summarising what's actually real on the ground um, you know, in the poverty and, and affordability space, we are well under-resourced in the financial counselling space in Queensland and far under-resourced compared to other states, particularly Victoria and New South Wales. So we're about 60% behind Victoria and New South Wales in funding. Um, but we do win the record in a lot of areas in regards to um, financial vulnerability. Uh, we have the highest domestic violence rates in Australia. We, we, we just got surpassed by another state, but we were holding that title as well with gambling addiction. Um, so, you know, we, we're not a state that is resilient in these areas. And we really do. I mean, I can't stress enough that um, community support um, provide a big, um, you know, it, it, it's such a critical service to people in this space. Um, Unfortunately, our financial capability workers, our registered as members has dropped significantly. And this is a concern because what's happening and what we're seeing is that um, we have agencies that may have got funding to supply budget counselling or some sort of education. Um, but when they start to deal with people in this space, they feel obligated to go beyond their actual qualifications. And it's no fault of their own. It's just that because of the pressures of demand, you know, we're seeing, and unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of now complaints coming our way um, because of these service providers that are providing wrong advice. And so it's something that, you know, um, all of us in this, we need to be very mindful to, you know, particularly the organisations and their responsibility to actually guide their, their workers of their scope and what they can and cannot do. Um, but you can see the impact now where, um, you know, financial capability workers are being pushed into, you know, providing some form of financial counselling, um, which can cause, um, you know, potential grief to all parties concerned. Um, why is there a need for membership? I've just explained the reason. For financial counselling, they must have membership to practise. Um, this is part of the ASIC exemption. So if any organisations are out there that are, you know, that are providing some form of financial counselling, look, please contact us. Um, this is what we're here for. We're here to support. We're not here to be big brother or anything. We're here to support agencies to get equipped to deliver whatever, whether it be a financial capability service or a financial counselling service. Um, and we have staff, good staff, to provide that support. Uh, yes, we're seeing burnout in, in the, particularly in the financial counselling space. Um, it's just because demand has gone through the roof. And unfortunately, as we've stated with government, where we had our low demand was when, and this is a good indicator, when we had our low demand was when um, people were receiving um, the job seeker, the increased job seeker support. Our demand actually dropped. And that's a good indicator of, you know, the importance of raising the rate. And we cannot sit here and pass judgment on people that are vulnerable to think that they're not good budgeters. I can tell you now they're the best budgeters going around the planet. They have to be. Um, and I think we need to change our approach in the way that we message budgeting to vulnerable people. And I think that's really important too. Um, I don't think we've got that right, all of us, to be honest with you. Um, the, I, I want to go on how important financial counselling is. And yes, I've, you know, Gayatri in the introduction sort of made mention of, you know, I've wavered so many millions of dollars for people. Is that, you know, is that a benefit or not? Yeah, in some cases it is, but it isn't the, it isn't the core benefit. The core benefit from financial counselling is actually reducing that immediate stress on a person. 
And if you've ever been in a situation where a creditor is pressing you for payments, you know, you are then vulnerable to, to that's when you are exposed to mental health issues. And unfortunately, credit providers, a lot of them don't, uh, they don't take that into account. Mainstream do. I, I must admit, there's been a lot of changes. But when we're talking about payday lenders, it's a whole different ballgame. And when you, you know, when you're talking about the basic standard approach or budgeting approach, and you have your living expenses, when you're under that, and we saw the graph that the majority of of Centrelink recipients were under that um, threshold. So what happens? You can't have a budget. There's no way you you can have the best budget on earth, but if you're under if you're under, you're under. So there's going to be two um, scenarios in that space. One is it looks at the biggest expense. And, and Gayatri mentioned rent is the biggest expense. And when it goes up and you can't afford it, it usually means that then people are a real risk of losing their home and they become homeless. homeless. The, the second is that they will try and fill the gap. So that gap area is where the existence of payday lenders and buy now pay later products come into play. And we see it because we've seen the absolute explosion of these types of um, credit products. Um, and no, men, no regulation is, um, unfortunately, no regulation is going to stop it. Because once you once ASIC pulls out one, another 20 takes its place. Um, this is, and until government invest in, in, in the regulator to actually um, stop more of this type of behavior and put a footprint on saying enough's enough, then we're gonna see this happen more time and time again. Once Cigna goes and it eventually will go, there'll be another player come, come in to take its place. Um, so again, when we talk about advocacy, we need to really remind government that there needs to be investment right along the, you know, the, the platform to be able to eradicate, you know, poor lending, um, poor lending providers. Um, so let's, if we move on to the, to the next slide, um, this is what we're seeing at the moment. So our sector, the financial counseling sector is playing a role as, as the community legal sector. So as QCOS and, and there's a range of, of peak associations and community leaders warning government about the impacts of buy now pay later and also the fringe lending products. Um, since the onset of COVID-19, members have been telling us that they're seeing clients with more complex associated with mental health, domestic violence, gambling, housing stress, and they are seeing greater numbers of people experiencing financial hardship through irregular incomes, more unaffordable debt through excessive late fees and poor industry hardship practices. So I've just sort of explained all of that. But what does that mean in a nutshell? It means that no matter, like having 20 or something years, I don't want to go too far into it, but it just shows that from back in 1995, when I first started, the, un the, the sad thing about it, where I've come from is there's some good things that we've improved on, but there's a lot of things we haven't over a 25 year period. And unfortunately, the exploitation of vulnerable, on vulnerable people to still exist. And now I don't think I've mentioned it in that paragraph, but scams are becoming a big um, player in also affecting vulnerable people, more so than mainstream. Um, so, you know, particularly in remote communities. So these are the things, if we talk about advocacy, these are the things that we've got to really hit hard with government, particularly um, housing, the housing supply, and, and I'm part of the CEO leadership group, and this is a big um, concern for us, is that in Queensland, we have a lack of public housing. Um, I know the government has, you know, put future funding away. Me personally, I don't, it doesn't come anywhere near what we need. And I think that that's one of the things that we really need to push moving forward in regards to improving that um, homeless rate and reducing it and also reducing poverty, particularly in Queensland, but also in Australia. So just the next slide, um, 
Maria, if that's this sort of replicates what Gayatri was saying about the, a particular type of target group, Ashley's story. We, we're seeing this, and this is the impacts of COVID too. So what's happened with COVID is there's been a lot of restructure in organisations, even in community organisations. And we've, we've, we've seen a lot of um, redundancies um, now through COVID. Uh, and what, what's that done is that it's, you know, people in this age group, you know, whether, and predominantly single um, uh, women um, are being either pushed down to a lower income bracket or being forced into, you know, full Centrelink payments. And, and I think with this particular case study, it sort of highlights the importance of working as a coordinated group in our sector. And I think it was one of the key points, Gaitra, I think in your report of that coordination and working together. And, and, and hopefully with Dare's presentation, because Good Shepherd will play a, a big role in this space as Uniting Care, as Money Care, as the Indigenous Consumer Assistance Network, all the neighbourhood centres, all the rural financial counselling, the list goes on. But if we're working in silos, I can guarantee you we're not going to we're not going to work or benefit the client the single client if we're not working together as one. And I really think that um, we need to break down our differences because there are differences there because that it's that old cliche of protecting your own backyard in the community space um, to get your funding. But if we're uh, if we're genuine about helping a person that is vulnerable and needing us help, and the only way that they get that help is a combined effort, then this is what we need to focus on. If, if we you know, get rid of all the boutique, nice little words and here and there, and what, this is what we do really nicely, and this is, this is our backyard, you know, we, we need to break down this barrier. And, and, I, and I strongly believe that QCOS should lead it as well as, as a lead, as a lead, um, peak body um, to, to, to break down these barriers. So that's just my two bobs worth in regards to the, to the report. And I think this is my final slide and I'll be, I won't be too long, but I think that's it actually. I think I've done pretty good. Hopefully I was in the time frame. I think so. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, that was, uh, and, and apologies for the, the, the tech gremlins. Ah, that's all right. I can talk underwater. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yes, you certainly did. <laughs> talk yes. uh, thank you very much. Certainly hear your message about coordination and working together, which is what we've been talking about as well. And that is a good segue to uh, what Amy is going to talk about. And I, I'll just very briefly give you an introduction of Amy. Uh, Amy is uh, the CEO of QCOS and has, is a strong advocate for equality, opportunity and well-being for all Queenslanders. Uh, she's been a very successful community lawyer and human rights advocate leading the successful campaign for a Human Rights Act in Queensland. Her work as a lawyer has focused on human rights and discrimination, guardianship, estate planning, child protection and domestic violence. She's also done uh, worked in various advisory and senior roles, including the Disability Royal Commission, Disability Law Queensland, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Women's Legal and Advocacy Service. So with that really, really quick introduction, uh, Amy, on to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gayatri. And if I could just begin by acknowledging that I'm on the land of the Turrbal and Yagara people and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And can I pay my respects to the traditional owners of all of the lands um, we're all coming from today. It's um, wonderful to see an audience from not just um, across the state, but also um, interstate. Um, can I pay my respects to the traditional owners of all of those lands, as well as any people who are joining us online today, any First Nations people? Um, can I also say um, thank you so much to Gayatri um, and can I acknowledge the amazing work that our research and advice team does? Um, we are really committed at QCOS to making sure that the work that we do has a very robust evidence base, and that includes both the things that we choose to focus on 
as well as the detail of our advocacy work. Um, and um, the research advice um, team does a great work, does a great job of producing that evidence base and you've seen some demonstration of that um, through the findings of our living affordability report. Um, also, can I just um, thank Dare for um, giving her presentation and um, talking about um, what Good Shepherd is doing in relation to living affordability, both in terms of um, service provision, capacity building, and then that really important um, research and advocacy work, I think sort of showing how Good Shepherd is tackling these issues at each um, level um, where we can have an influence. And then John, um, great to hear from you um, your insights about the systemic um, drivers of poverty, as well as um, the really important work that um, the really important work that financial counsellors can do. And I also just really wanted to thank you for um, calling out the strengths and capacity of people um, who are on low incomes, and really, um, you know, making sure we're clear about um, the fact that people um, reliant on income support. Uh, you know, it's not that they need to learn the skills to budget. There's some systemic issues there um, that are preventing people from being able to make ends meet. And I think that story um, you told, Ashley's story, you know, heartbreaking story that really demonstrates um, the value of proper income and proper social support service so that when people have, and all of us, you know, that story shows us all of us are vulnerable um, to life happening and um, things meaning that we're in a crisis and we do need supports. If we have those supports in place, it really does mean that um, when things happen, we can cushion the crisis and allow people to use their resources, skills and capacity to also, um, you know, get back on their feet. So thank you um, to all of you. What I wanted to talk about today was um, I guess the advocacy work that QCOS is doing in relation to um, living affordability and um, particularly over this 12 month period, you know, I guess um, this, the um, information that Gayatri laid out does demonstrate that there are uh, things that both the federal and state government could do um, to make sure that, um, you know, we, we overcome some of the systemic um, barriers for people to um, you know, live in li live lives that are not characterised by um, poverty. So I wanted to sort of um, talk about um, a few things. So if if you conceptualise some of our advocacy work as having that central theme of um, living affordability and poverty alleviation, then there's some um, key moments um, in our advocacy time frame in the next 12 months, including um, the federal budget in March, um, a federal election uh, most, uh, you know, expected in May, and then Queensland state budget on the 21st of June. So we have absolutely um, hit the ground running this year in terms of being very focused um, about what we're going to be talking about in connection with each of those things. Um, and eyes on the federal election, we have very clear um, messaging around um, what we would like from our federal government. And really our advocacy focuses on income support and housing. So um, everyone has really already um, discussed the need for an adequate level of income support. Um, and certainly um, that's something that we will continue um, to advocate for um, also off the back of the ACOS Raise the Rate campaign. Um, and we are saying that at a minimum, um, the uh, level of income support should be $69 a day. I think, um, you know, as Gayatri referenced, in 2020, we had this moment in time where we could actually see uh, the difference that raising the rate of income support would make. And our 2020 um, living affordability report painted such a different picture of living affordability in Queensland. We had people being able to um, meet the basics, um, be able to pay their rent, be able to uh, put three meals on the table and pay their electricity bill. And on that, I'd say we also did a piece of um, research with Deloitte through the Energy Council that looked at some data 
um, that energy retailers had, which clearly demonstrated that through that period, um, people were coming off hardship programs um, and people were paying their bills on time and even paying down debt. So we do know, we do have recent um, evidence to demonstrate what happens when we raise um, the level of income support. And from a human services perspective, John made the case there to say, um, also it takes pressure off our social services system, which is an, you know, an expensive um, system in itself um, when people have the money in their pockets to um, make, pay you know, for the basic things that they need so that they're not living a life characterised by poverty. The other thing um, that we would be, uh, we will be and have been very focused on at a federal level is the housing crisis. Um, and so um, it is clear that this housing crisis that we're experiencing here in Queensland can't be solved by the state government alone. Um, it needs a partnership approach from um, the federal and state government working together. That has been the case since, um, you know, the housing agreement was signed after the Second World War, which, you know, provides that the state is delivering housing, but the Commonwealth government is a major funder of um, social housing around the country. We do need um, a very significant increase into social housing. Uh, we would like the Commonwealth rent assistance to be increased by 50%. And um, it is shocking to see that the um, rental National Rental Affordability Scheme, which is a federal scheme, which is subsidising people on low incomes um, so they're able to pay their rent, it will be completely um, phased out by next year um, which means that there are potentially going to be another 11,000 households in Queensland added to our social housing register, which already has 50,000 um, people uh, on it, more than um, 50,000 people. And I can, can I emphasise that, yeah, we are in a, in a crisis. That number um, has increased by 80% over the last four years. People are now waiting on the social housing register on average um, for two years. And also there are um, pretty much no other options because outside Brisbane, there is almost there is less than 1% um, rental availability. Uh, so we are um, asking for the federal government to um, make those significant investments. Um, you may have seen last year, that um, like the Labor Party have already come out with a social housing policy. Um, it would see, I, I believe, um, it would see an additional 20,000 um, uh, dwellings nationally per year. That is um, welcome, but, uh, you know, to steal some of um, John's words in relation to our state government, it's just not enough. We want to see stronger commitments um, from um, whomever um, comes in um, as our government after the May election. We are about to relaunch. Um, some people may have seen our Town of Nowhere campaign, um, which we ran um, last year, um, particularly with the state um, budget insight, um, which uh, I guess put some uh, put a concept around the staggering numbers on the social housing register, saying, you know, if everyone um, on the social housing register came together and formed a town, it would be Queensland's fifth biggest town, so bigger than Maryborough or Gympie, just to give you a, a sort of concept of um, the staggering nature of the crisis. We ran um, the Town of Nowhere campaign up to the state budget and saw that $2.9 billion um, invested by the state government, and we have decided to relaunch that campaign and I might just call out our partnership with Anchor Care Central Queensland, Centre Care Central Queensland, Footprints um, Community, Kyabra Community Association, Lifeline Darling Downs, and Southwest Queensland Micro Project, Save the Children, and St Vincent de Paul, who are working in partnership with us as founding partners of the second iteration of the Town of Nowhere campaign. If I could just go to the next slide, Maria. Thank you. So this um, here is speaking to the advocacy that we're doing directed at the state um, government. So uh, we have done quite a lot of work um, to put together these um, budget priorities. We 
um, ran um, a series of town halls all across the state um, in the second half of last year and listened really carefully to um, what our members were saying about where investment is required. Um, we have put um, the um, budget submission out for consultation and done a lot of engagement with government already. And today we've published our budget submission. Uh, and these are the five areas of focus um, that we are um, advocating for in connection with this state budget. Uh, so the first, and what I've done here is just highlighted the connection between these priorities and I guess living affordability and, and poverty um, eradication. So the first um, priority is um, specifically about community services. So we are asking for um, an indexation rate to be applied consistently across all state government um, contracts and that that um, indexation calculation actually properly reflects increased costs to community services. As many of you would be aware, the current um, indexation calculation is tied to um, the CPI and, um, and wage increases. So uh, really it's not actually reflecting, um, it, it's, it has no real relationship to um, the increased costs for community services. We want Treasury to adopt a model that reflects increased costs um, shows us how they've calculated it and then applies it consistently. Um, so it doesn't matter which line agency is funding you, you'll get the same indexation. And um, we think um, that that will improve wages and job quality for community sector workers. Um, we are doing a piece of research with the University of Western Australia at the moment to have to actually have a demonstration of what those increased costs have been. And we're hoping to be able to publish that research in March. Um, we are really a huge supporter, of course, of our um, community and neighbourhood centres. And um, we are seeking for a historic investment by the Queensland government into community and neighbourhood centres um, to make sure that we they have the capacity to um, be those first responders to Queenslanders in crisis. And our submission budget submission includes both increased costs for wages, so we can have some more um, boots on the ground, as well as some capital works to make sure we've got um, community and neighbourhood centres in all the, the locations we need them in Queensland. Uh, obviously, we are continuing to um, advocate for uh, further investment into social housing as well as um, some funding for specific initi uh, initiatives that would um, benefit children who are experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity. Um, you know, this is a real problem in our state. Um, there are large numbers of children in Queensland experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. And uh, our view is that that is simply unacceptable. Uh, we would like to see, um, we, QCOS is um, involved in, uh, we, I, I sit on the Ministerial Energy Council and chair the Consumer Voice Subcommittee um, of that Ministerial Energy Council. And our involvement in that process is really to make sure that um, the perspectives and experiences of um, people on low incomes are incorporated into that plan. Uh, so, what we would like to see is to ensure that this 10 year energy plan that the Queensland government is in the process of developing, um, what that energy plan does is maps our course um, to a transition to renewables. Uh, QCOS would like to see that path include ensuring that um, benefits are experienced by low income households. And so um, ultimately a reduction in power bills. Uh, finally, we're really, um, we are, and Gartree did a wonderful job of um, highlighting the gendered, um, the gendered nature of um, living afford uh, poverty and living affordability um, issues. We, there is a huge existing, uh, very large gender pay gap uh, in Queensland, and there is more that the Queensland government could do to reduce um, reduce that pay gap. We would like um, as a first step for 
um, the government to implement gender responsive budgeting approach to the state budget. What that really means is that you would have a dedicated resource within Treasury that's looking at how is government spending either um, helping to uh, reduce gender inequality or is it um, further exacerbating it? So, for example, a really simple example would be, you know, last year we saw um, governments, um, put, we saw stimulus spending and um, at a state level, we obviously saw that going into the building and construction sector which we were happy to see because the results of that is more social housing. Uh, but we need to acknowledge that when government puts large amounts of money to stimulate parts of our economy that are dominated by men, that the result of that is more jobs for men, better quality and better paid jobs for men. So through procurement practices to um, sort of uh, mitigate those um, impacts, you would be looking to procure um, services from businesses who have, you know, really progressive policies around employing and training women into that sector, just as an example of the types of things that government can do um, to um, bring that um, gender pay gap closer together or hopefully over time eliminate it, um, rather than um, what our research shows is if we continue to go the way we're currently going, that we will see that gender pay gap further and further apart. So um, that's um, really, um, in a nutshell, the advocacy work that QCOS will be doing this year in connection with um, our living affordability report and um, trying to, um, I guess, eliminate poverty in Queensland. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Amy. Um, we've got uh, Keely uh, asking a question to everyone. Um, she says, just wondering if there are reflections regarding our, where our population is currently spread regarding baby boomers 1945 to 1961, leaving large population between 1945, so 75 years to 67 years with increasing numbers each year. Also the building of population 20, 2005 to 2015 related to paid to have children, one, one child for one mom and for one, one for country. Um, and it's a massive load on the education system. So, um, so I think the question is, are there any reflections regarding where our population is, is currently spread? And from what I understand, if that is going to have a bearing on how we, um, we, we approach the systemic issues that we've just talked about today. Does anyone want to, does any, anyone have any reflections on where, how we're going to be advocating, I guess, with our, with where our population is going? Well, look, I don't have any recent stats in regards to population spread. I think that, I think the question probably focuses on the services to support people, you know, vulnerable people and, and how, you know, compared to population, is there enough services compared to population ratio um, throughout Queensland? Um, I, I, you know, it's a, a good question, but very hard to sort of answer it accurately. Uh, I do think, and, and uh, but I, I think it is important for government to actually assess this properly. Um, we see, like an example for me is that I was talking about financial counselling services and the majority of our services are either positioned in the Brisbane metropolitan area or the or the Sunshine, Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast and the Cairns region. But in between those two, it's the services are sparse. And, and so if it's if it's if that in financial counseling was a reflection of other services, then yes, I think, you know, I think there's disparity um, amongst that 
particular ratio that I mentioned, and, and it's something that government and maybe advocacy groups can raise if they've got that information at, at play to use to say, hey, we need to fill the gap areas. And, and yes, there are gap areas in, in Queensland. Yep, if I could just add to that, uh, add to what John said, uh, we've uh, at QCOS, we've picked this up in our other piece of research, which is looking at emerging issues uh, in um, in 2021 and out to uh, the, the 2032 uh, Olympics. So we think that there is a, an excellent opportunity now that the government's going to be getting into the planning space for the Olympics to actually think about service needs for, for the community as well. Um, that is yet unpublished work, but then we let you all know when, when that comes out, but we do make a reference to how much the population is going to be increasing in the next 10 years. And we've seen during COVID that we've had certain disruptions to the trend as well. Uh, so it's, it's a very interesting question and a very interesting space to watch because uh, yes, most certainly uh, community service system planning needs to keep up with, uh, with all the changes in, that we're going to see in our population in our state. Um, I don't think we have any other, other questions. So I'd just like to finish by, by thanking you all for tuning in today. And thank you very much to all our speakers as well. Uh, for presenting some really inspiring work that your organizations are doing. And I think we walk away with the call for collective action front and center of our minds. That is, uh, it, it's a really uplifting message. Um, I also want to say that uh, at QCOS with our research and advice team, we, uh, we work in partnership with communities. So we are always looking for opportunities to engage and hear what you have to say. So please do get in touch. We are going to be working on our 2022 living affordability project, which is just going to start off. So always open to hearing thoughts, ideas, and anything you can share. So uh, thank you all very much for tuning in. <laughs>